Hi, I'm Mina Hajin and I'm chief and editor of Røde Radio, Norwegian Prison Radio. Denne episoden av Air Hustle innehåller språk och tema. This episode of Air Hustle contains language and subject matter including a graphic description of suicide that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. I remember the first day on death row as a brand new cop. You know that they're all there for committing very, very heinous, violent acts. And the people uh, have created people's nightmares and horror stories. As soon as you open the first door, that guy walks out of the cell. It's not just one of them. It's a whole building of them. How can that not be intense? You're now tuned in to San Quentin's Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. I'm Nigel Poor, a visual artist, now podcaster. My inside co-host, Rasan New York Thomas, will not be hosting this episode with me because San Quentin is now in lockdown. You will be hearing his voice on the tape asking some questions, though. But to tell this week's story, I've got this guy here. I'm Erlon Woods, a podcaster and former resident of San Quentin. And together, we're going to take you inside and back outside again. On this episode, we're talking about what it's like to live with a death sentence and beyond. Around uh, 2.30 in the morning, two of the sheriffs just came and told me, hey, uh, we finna transfer you. Waited on them to um, return. You could hear them uh, dragging chains and handcuffs and stuff down the tiers. They were on the way to come get me. So uh, I got all chained up. And one side of the cell, they put on um, leg shackles with uh, padlocks. With each step, like the lock would bang against your ankle. Man, that's, uh, it's uh, an annoying pain. When I got to the bus, I was actually the last guy on. The regular guys were already uh, seated. When I come up on the steps, one of the sheriffs let the other one know. Uh, he said, uh, end of the road. And I asked him, actually, what did that mean? He said, well, um, a death sentence is end of the road. We got to San Quentin. It was uh, after dinner. Um, two guards came and got me and took me up to the fourth tier. I looked around and said, like, man, I'm actually here. I am one that could actually be put to death at any time. There are over 700 people on death row at San Quentin. They're not part of the main line, though, so you rarely see them, except maybe when they're being escorted to medical or something like that. We've said this before. Death row is a prison within a prison. Here's what's odd about that. There's a lot of guys up there, but there hasn't been an execution at San Quentin for 13 years, since 2006. That's when a federal judge ruled that the way California put people to death, the particular mix of drugs used in lethal injection, was unconstitutional. A few times in the past decade, California voters have narrowly voted to keep the death penalty. In fact, in 2016, voters passed a measure to speed up the appeals process for people on death row. And man, that shocked me, because basically voters wanted people to die faster after they were sentenced. But earlier this year, the new governor, Gavin Newsom, unexpectedly called for a moratorium on executions in California. That didn't do away with the death penalty or with death row. It just means he pushed pause. With that moratorium, you'd think the death penalty in California was on its way out. Mm -hmm. But if you look at history, one thing's for sure— Public opinion, laws, and policies are always changing. Meanwhile, the residents of San Quentin experienced the issue very personally. After each execution, there's an eerie quietness, like something is missing. That's Lonnie Morris. He's been in prison for 42 years, 38 of those years in San Quentin. He was there when execution started up again in 1992 after a 25-year pause. The first person they executed when they started to... Uh, executions back up in uh, California was 
uh, a gentleman by the name of Robert Alton Harris. On the night that uh, Robert Alton Harris was to be executed, they, they locked us down. I was in my cell, so I started to, the, the, from the time I locked up, I started to kind of, I don't, I hate the term, but what we call the death watch, you know what I'm saying? You know, watching the news to see how this situation was going, because we knew that his lawyers were going to try to get an injunction uh, against the execution, right? Every news channel was, you know, tuned to it. When the United States Supreme Court said no more stays, that was like, oh, my God. They just said, well, I don't care what you come with. He dying. And he dying before sunrise this day. I didn't know Robert Alton Harris, um, but the process was something that I knew that this was going to be heralding the death of other people that was on death row. Oh I thought it would be relatively quick, five, six, seven years, somewhere around in there. And um, when I got there, I met guys that had been there uh, since like 78, just waiting around. This is Watson Allison. We heard him earlier. He goes by Al, and in 1984, he was sentenced to death for felony robbery murder. Were you a people's nightmare? Um, some. Uh, my, uh, the victims of my, my life crime, yes, I, I was. Al had been on death row for more than four years when he got his first date, what's called a death warrant. It was one of several he'd get. I was on the yard. Lieutenant wanted to talk to you. He sent for me to come out, come in. And um, he told me, um, the governor uh, just ex- just issued a death warrant for you. So um, you want to sign it? I'm like, nah, I refuse to sign it. But um, it's going to go on whether you refuse to sign it or sign it. There was a choice, cyanide poisoning or uh, lethal injection. So... You make your own choice or uh, staff members make, make the choice for you if you decide not to choose. And oh, this is a gruesome question to ask. I'm sorry. Did you select how you were going to be executed? No, I didn't let them do that, the, uh, the guards and um, the lieutenant. Do you know what they chose? Um, cyanide poison. The gas chamber? Yes. In 1938, the gas chamber replaced the gallows. To hear more about this history, we have to reopen a book that some listeners might remember from a previous episode. The San Quentin Story by Clinton T. Duffy. It was published in 1950, and it's about Duffy's experience at San Quentin as he moved up through the ranks and finally became the warden. I remember seeing the dumpy little riveted steel cell the day it was delivered at the San Quentin docks on a barge. It weighed somewhat over two tons without its grim accessories, and the state paid a Denver firm $5,016.68 for it. Another $10,000 was spent installing the gas chamber, and a small pig from a prison farm was the first victim when its ineffable efficiency was tested. So... Man, so when you when he called you, and you found out what he wanted, like what what, what happened to your body when you heard that? Um, I went numb for a minute, uh, a lot of anxiety, uh, nervousness. I'm saying, okay, this is uh, I'm like okay, I got pretty much sixty days before it actually happened. The Manual of Operations lists 21 separate steps for the technical operations alone, and the equipment recommended by the manufacturer and kept on hand includes funnels, rubber gloves, graduates, acid pumps, gas masks, cheesecloths, steel chains, towers, soap, pliers, scissors, fuses, and a mop. Do you remember how the CO was? Was he nervous? Did he no. make eye contact? Mm-mm. He was a uh, business, you know, just business. 
no emotion uh, expressed. You know, I mean, I was sent there to be executed. You know, I think it was like June 13th. That was, uh, I think, 1989. The chemical supplies include sodium cyanide eggs, sulfuric acid, distilled water, and ammonia, with a discount if they're bought in quantity. We pay about 50 cents for a pound of cyanide, enough to execute one man, but other expenses, including the executioner's $50 fee, the prorated time of the warden, guards, doctors, and technicians, and such things as new clothing for the prisoner to wear for his death, bring the cost of the average execution to $150. So when, when you knew you had this expiration date, what changed in you inside as a person? I strive to uh, talk to uh, like my son, a um, couple of individuals that I really cared about that were still in my life, and just, you know, try to, like, get me in order spiritually. Time seemed, uh, seemed to speed up. It seemed like the days were going past faster. A couple of, a couple of psychiatrists came to see me um, just to check on my mental status. I had actually sat with uh, my mom and my sister and signed some paperwork where after the execution was done to have my body released to, uh, to them for uh, um, cremation and um, a burial service. My mom, my sister, and my lawyer were very emotional, and um, it affected me. So what's so scary about dying? Well, for myself, it's uh, facing the unknown. You know, you hear a lot of stuff about the hereafter, uh, uh, condemnation or paradise, you know. Uh, okay, where am I going to go? Where am I going to land? So, Because I do believe that uh, there is a hereafter. So it's all about... Um, Am I going this way or that way? Where did you think you were going to go? Um, I think I was going down under. I am sorry to say that many of the thousands of citizens I have conducted through the prison actually enjoy standing in the death house and often are bored with any other phase of prison life. Men visitors are generally awed by the cold surgical neatness of the little green room where the gas chamber squats and look away self-consciously when we explain how the executioner's lever drops the cyanide into an acid bucket beneath the condemned man's chair. But many women listen with a curious sort of rapture and scores of them have walked right into the nine-foot chamber itself and sat down in the metal chair just to see how it feels. Uh, May the 4th, 1970, I was sentenced to die in a gas chamber at San Quentin. This is Abu Qadir Alamin. He was high on heroin when he killed a security guard in 1969. We wanted to find out from him what death row was like back then in the 1970s. What was it like acclimating to life on death row? Mm, I didn't really acclimate. I began to work on what I felt were my character defects, and I didn't want to die in the condition that I was in that led me to be there in the first place. I read a lot. I studied. I read history. I read science, math. Uh, I read books about faith, and also I exercised, and I used to fast a lot. I would eat one meal every other day. I kind of was uh, not willing to enjoy the comforts that existed there. Really? This is the first I've ever heard anyone say that. What was comfortable there? Well, we had our own uh, special kitchen that cooked just for people on death row. Uh, maybe some mornings we'd have steak and eggs, 
you know, I didn't have steak and eggs on the, on, uh, in the free world. So we would have steak and eggs and, you know, toast and juice. And, and I saw people getting big bellies up there and getting comfortable. And I said, man, they fattening us up for the kill. Steak and eggs, Erlon? Did you ever have steak and eggs in prison? Hell no. <laughs> I had to wait till I got out of prison for that one. I remember that meal. But back in the day, food in prison was way better. Not just for the guys on death row, but for everyone. Nowadays, death row get the same food as the main line. And let's just say you only eat it because you have to. Yep. And by the time Al got to death row in the 1980s, steak and eggs were long gone. Can you describe your world there? Isolated, dreary, a lot of loneliness, sadness. That just came, became routine. So what do you think when people say, I'd, I'd rather die than, than spend my life in prison? Me? It never crossed my mind. I, uh, I wanted to live. I had determined never to witness an execution. I kept this resolve until October 2nd, 1930. At nine o'clock that morning, the baby-faced murderer had been found writhing on the floor of the death cell, screaming that he had swallowed poison. Dr. Stanley went to work on him with a stomach pump, but when we reached the cell, Northcott was still trembling and sobbing that the rope was going to hurt. I never have heard anyone complain about its hurting, Dr. Stanley said quietly. I want a blindfold over my eyes, Northcott cried. Let me walk slowly. Warden Holohan, pale and plainly suffering, nodded to the guards. They quickly tied a black bandage around the boy's eyes and the death march began. I hung back as we entered the high gallows room on the top floor of the crumbling furniture factory, and Warden Holohan turned his eyes away from the rope. Northcott stumbled and sagged, and the guards carried him up the steps. I heard him weeping, and he said, Say a prayer for me, please. Warden Holohan raised his right hand, a tired and unwilling hand, and it was over. One of my best friends, he was my neighbor. You know, we, we could talk about anything, seemed like, and, and we was talking, it was on a, on a Sunday. And so uh, it got to be like dinner time, and so uh, he beat on the wall and he told me, hey man, uh, the rope, it'll work. And I'm like, man, what you tripping on? And he said, uh, the rope, bro, it'll work. And I'm like, man, look, kick back. We'll holler in a minute. And uh, at the time, I wasn't eating desserts. So the guard came up to fix our trays, and I told him, uh, give him my dessert. And he gave him my dessert. And there's only like four or five more uh, cells on the tier to feed. So he fed those guys, and we turned around, boom, the alarm went off. And I stuck my mirror out, and... The guard was opening his door, and um, when he opened his door, he was swinging back and forth on it, and um, he was gone. Um, he just did that, and uh, it was like uh, my stomach or something had been ripped open. There are suicides down on the main line, too. Mm -hmm. Guys just give up. But one thing they don't have is a constant threat of execution. Or a stay of execution. On death row, you get a date, and you think you're going to die in 60 days, and then you hear something else. And it's got to be emotional chaos. And I wonder, like, how do they deal with it? I don't know. After about 27, 28 days, I think uh, I got the news that a uh, stay had been granted. And um, I fell back into my regular old normal routine. It seemed like the days just pretty much all blended into each other. I, I, I quit using calendars. I would know just 
like if I write a letter, I'll put June 2019, right? But as far as the actual dates and stuff, I quit using calendars uh, many years ago. I still don't use them. As far as normal death row life, um, you're in your cell a lot. You may go to your from like maybe nine, eight, nine o'clock to about 12 o'clock. Pretty much 12, 12, 30, the whole program's over. So whatever you have going on in your cell, you're back in there. I had a routine where I worked out like about three times a day. I just burn off energy and uh, relief to actually uh, stay balanced. Let me ask you this, I know in visiting, if you're on death row, they put you and your family in that cage. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that cage? The visiting room cage? About four foot, four foot, about maybe five foot. Well, the visitors would already be in the cage when I get there, and they would see me get unhandcuffed and everything else and let in. Um, you, you bring all of your food in with you. Um, if they need to go to the bathroom or something, I would have to be handcuffed and taken out of the cage first before they would let them out. How does it feel to be on a visit where your family has to literally get in the cage to see you? It's hard, really. You know, but they love you enough to do this for you. I used to refuse visits because I didn't want certain people going through those experiences. I put myself here. I'm responsible for this, so uh, I don't want you suffering and having to say um, goodbye to them um, because uh, goodbye is really is, is final. I definitely remember the day that I stood in front of this man's cell. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin, and the guy who signs off on every episode of this podcast. That was also Sam we heard at the top of the episode. He was telling us about his time as a CO on death row, where he first met Al. And Al made an impression. Uh, I remember it like it's yesterday. Um, it was on the fifth tier. One of our protocols before we release... Uh, maximum security inmates from their cells is um, you take all their clothing from them, all the items that they're taking out to the yard are exiting their cell in, and you conduct a visual on clothes body search on them while they're locked away on the side of their cells. And I, and I did that. And, I was, and so sure enough, I'm going through this white T-shirt, and I hit this bump. Uh, and his eyes got big threw his hands up. It's like, man, you got me. <laughs> there was no words exchanged or anything like that. What do you think? Drugs, Erlon? Some kind of contraband. Mm -hmm. In any case, Sam and Al go way back. Yep. They first met on death row, but Al also saw Sam when he was sent to the adjustment center. The AC. It's the hole for death row. It's where you go when you don't follow the rules. He had come over for messing up. Al was Al. Uh, he'd beat you if he could. Uh, he was always involved in nefarious activities. Always respectful. Uh, never disrespectful to me. Um, if someone told me that he had been to them, I think I would have been shocked because that wasn't what I got from him. But he was a, he was a con all the way through my time there. I stayed in mischief. Uh, um, rule violations for all kind of madness. That kind of madness affects your visits. It even affects your family. Right, because when you're put in AC, all your visits are non-contact. It's through the glass, and you talk to your visitors on the phone. And this is where Al's mom met him one day after driving up from Southern California. My mom came and told me, uh, boy, what the hell's wrong with you? You're still acting stupid. So she came all the way from Long Beach, and she had bought a bunch of food and stuff, and I couldn't get it. So she just piled it all up in the window and um, allowed me to look at it while, while she talked to me. And you're on the phone. Mm -hmm. And what was the food? Do you remember what the food mm, was? Burritos, burgers, fries, sodas and stuff. You know, um, I like sour candy, so she had bought, like, gummy worms and um, honey buns, all that type of stuff. So she told me, well, you know, you can't eat none of this, so I'm going to give it to other people. And um, she said, man, you you continuing to do stupid shit, you know. And uh, she was right. When you're going to grow up. Was yeah, she really angry with you? Yes, very. Um, I wouldn't even repeat a lot of stuff she said. 
But yeah, she was angry. I was just tired of the, the BS that I was into. And um, I stepped back and started evaluating myself, beginning to take another path away from uh, BS, uh, away from negativity. Yeah, how old were you at that point? Um, I was in, I think I was like about 51, 52 years old. I was shocked when he said that. He's 60 now, but man, he looks like he's 40. Well, that can happen when you don't get a lot of sunlight. Yeah. The skin stays fresh. I don't know. In any case, after 29 years on death row, his case took a dramatic turn. I was eating a tuna sandwich and some potato chips. Three guards showed up at my door and told me, hey, the lieutenant want to speak to you. And um, I got stripped out. I got handcuffed. Um, hearts pounding. Uh, I'm like, body's kind of kind of warm. When I get there, he's standing outside his office, and he, he pats me on the back and tells me congratulations and um, asks me to come in his office and have a seat. And I'm like, this is all new. And um, I sit down, he says, uh, congratulations, man. They just overturned your case. So me and the lieutenant, we talked for a little bit, and they brought me the telephone and let me use it. I called my mom, and she was, she was crying, and um, she, was, she was joyful. When I came out of his office, it was like I was walking on clouds or something. It was like I was in a daze. I was in, like, a trance or a dream or whatever. And next thing you know, I'm back in my cell getting unhandcuffed, and uh, I just sat on the bunk. I couldn't eat. Um, That night, I couldn't sleep or none of that. In 2010, a federal judge reversed the original jury's finding that Al intentionally murdered the victim and that he used a gun during the incident and set aside his death sentence. A year and a half later, the DA decided not to retry him. He was resentenced to 25 years to life. After 29 years on death row, Al was moved to a part of the prison called Badger, which is a reception center for prisoners getting processed into the main line. So at that point, um, they came and um, packed my property, handcuffed me, took me to the front door of East Block, and um, took the handcuffs off, which was very strange. When I got to Badger section, there was a CO over there. He knew me. So when he put me in the cell, I actually bagged up to uh, get the handcuffs took off. And he's like, man, what are you doing? And I'm like, what? And I realized then that the handcuffs weren't, weren't on. For the first time in almost three decades, Al was out of his cell without handcuffs on. I mean, freedom is relative, but that was a big deal. So Al got off death row because of a development in his case. He's now on the main line. But Abu Qadir Alamin, who was sentenced to death in 1970, he got off death row under very different circumstances. He got off the row because the law changed. In 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the death penalty, and Abu remembers it well. I do remember that night. We stayed up all night, maybe two nights in a row. It was an atmosphere of uh, exuberance. People were excited. People were happy. People were talking, you know, just imagining that they're not going to be under that circumstance anymore and, you know, we'll be, you know, uh, have a possibility of getting out and coming home. Abu was resentenced to seven years to life, and after serving eight years, in 1978, he was found suitable for parole and released. Well, I'm grateful that uh, that wasn't my end destination, that I didn't uh, uh, die there. I owe a debt to the society that spared my life. So I always think about that. I have to uh, acknowledge that that was a turning point in my life. After he got out of prison, Abu became an imam at a mosque in the Bay Area. He also works on criminal justice issues. When we come back, we're going to hear from Al about what it's like to adjust to life on the main line after death row. Dudes were talking about we having chicken on the bone tonight. And I'm like, what's the big deal? (laughs) 
I think the first time I saw Al off death row was, um, he was over in Badger section, I think it was. Were you in Badger section? Mm -hmm. First tier. Uh, first tier Badger section, near the officer's podium, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I think I was just walking through and he had this voice yelling at me. Yes. <laughs> like, Robbie, he's like, huh? Like, dude, you ain't off the road? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, last time I, he said, the last time I saw you, you were in the adjustment center. When you get caught by someone, you remember that person. You know, you respect them. Of course, I uh, talk to other individuals about you. <laughs> hey, you do not try to beat this guy with nothing in your clothes. Oh, man. He's, he's going through your stuff. He had a little conversation and um, congratulated me. I think you, uh, you walked off. After a bit of time in Badger section, Al was sent to Solano, another prison in Northern California. When I got to Solano, uh, it was a lot going on. You got dudes that walk around all night like zombies, day sleepers. I'm used to everything coming to my cell. The phone, canteen, everything, right? So I have to go to everything. Standing in line, got dudes in front of me, dudes in back of me, dudes on the sides and stuff. Sitting at tables, just, just interacting. Uh, at first I found myself watching everybody, uh, you know, I'm, like some paranoia was in. Um, I, I used to just go to the shower and I would go eat or use the phone and I'm back inside the dorm. I, didn't, I wasn't uh, interacting. I wasn't used to that. I'm, I'm used to just dealing with myself. And then there was that chicken on the bone. Erlon, did you have chicken on the bone in prison? Hell yeah, chicken on the bone. Have you ever had chicken on the bone, Nige? Well, the thing is, you don't talk about it on the outside because you always have chicken on the bone. <laughs> I always got a bone on it. But nah, chicken on the bone in prison was like every Sunday, and then they stopped giving it out. And then they start just giving it out on holidays. Mm. So every, when they say chicken on the bone, everybody going. It's something special. Very special. It's chicken on the bone. Yeah, you got the drumstick and part of the breast connected together with the bone. It had been over 30 years, actually, since I'd seen that. And sitting down, eating at a table with, like, me and three other guys, you know, dudes were having conversation over a meal. And uh, I'm a slow eater, so um, from being by myself. And everybody's, you know, they're, they're eating and talking at the same time, and um, it was strange. When I came out of the dining hall, I just happened to look up. The stars were out there. So while I'm walking, I'm just I'm looking up while I'm walking, just um, admiring this. And um, it tripped me out. I forgot all about that type of stuff. I actually realized, man, I haven't even seen the moon and the stars in a long, long time. The moon and the stars, that's got to be nice when you haven't seen them in, like, decades. Ooh. I mean, I still, to this day, out here, look up at the stars and the moon and the water and be stuck. Why, does it look different out here? It's, I mean, it's tranquil. It's like you don't get to see it a lot, you yeah. know? You, you, you off the yard before that happens, you know? So there was those nice moments. Chicken on the bone, seeing the stars. But there were a lot of things about life on the main line that were difficult for Al. And while he was still at Solano, he made an unusual request. There's a lady there, uh, Miss Chu. So she called me for an assessment. She was talking to me and stuff. I was real standoffish. And I just asked her, hey, uh, can you send me back? And she's like, what? And I'm like, man, can you send me back to death row? And she said, boy, are you crazy? I'm not going to do that. You're in general population, but what I'm going to do for you is she assigned two peer mentors. Uh, they helped me a lot. Well, what, what was overwhelming you, do you think? Um, the movement. Uh, isolation is not good. Is it harder for you to attach to people? Yes, it is. Um, I'm standoffish. Um, I'm guarded. Uh, evasive. Um, you may be watching me, but I'm watching you, you know, just, just guarded. How is it speaking? Speaking to people that you don't that you don't know. I'm slow, slow, slow to speak. Uh, I'll listen to you and process what you say. I don't just blurt something right out. You know, I'll, I'll it's running in my mind. What do I want, actually want to say? 
Not that long ago, Al was transferred back to San Quentin. When I got here, I was, uh, I was kind of excited. Then I, I seen some familiar faces with um, some of the COs and stuff, like, hey, you know, they're all getting ready to retire. And it actually um, showed me how old I'm getting. A few years ago, Al went to his first parole board here. And I was so quiet in there that the commissioner actually asked me, am I going to say anything? But now, um, today, if I get the opportunity to uh, be back in front of that same commissioner, um, we can talk. You know, I can, I can open up and uh, express me. So, Erlon, I know you weren't there, but I have to tell you, it was so hard to get Al to talk to us for this story. I mean, I I definitely can understand that because, you know, when you have people that's been incarcerated for a long time, Mm -hmm. they usually don't open up to people. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had like six conversations with him before we even got him down to the media lab. And the first time I met him, he was so blank. You know what I mean? Like he was clearly uncomfortable. Yeah. Decades of isolation can do that to you. But the thing that was really cool over the time, maybe the six weeks that we were trying to get him to do the story, he really changed. And, like, he started smiling and opening up. And one thing that really stood out to me was that I said to him, you know, it's really great to see you smile. And about a week later, he came up to me. He's like, can I talk to you for a minute? And he said, I wanted to ask you, when you told me that it was nice to see me smile, was that a good thing? Hmm. And I was like, hell yeah, of course it's a good thing. How does it feel to go on a visit now with your family? It's crowded. It's crowded out there, man. You know, it's a trip seeing the little kids walking around playing, uh, being able to walk to the microwave and cook some stuff, actually go to the vending machines and pick out what you want to eat instead of just trying to uh, just, just sit there and talk to people without being in a cage. You know, it's, it's good. And... Um, being able to walk around with your people and talk to them, not just isolated to the point where you're sitting in a chair. You can actually get up and stretch your legs, move about a little bit. If Al was still the knucklehead that I knew, Al would have never made it back to San Quentin. And so obviously, it turned the corner somewhere. It's amazing what over 20 years would do. <laughs> 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 that was a trip. Cause I, like I say, the first day, I don't think that I would have ever imagined that someone on the bro, uh, when I would sit across from them, open cuffs, uh, dialed in from a microphone inside the prison at San Quentin and have a conversation about it. Um, I never thought that uh, I would be in this position at all. I, uh, I thought, okay, life was going to be over on death row. And um, by the grace that it wasn't, and then sitting in this position, I never imagined it, man, never. Are there ever times now where you want to go back? Not a chance. (laughs) Not a chance, not at all. Thanks to Al and Abu for talking to us about their experiences on and off death row. And to Lonnie Morris for sitting down with us as well. Also, we want to thank Lee Jaspar for reading those passages from Warden Duffy's book, The San Quentin Story. Ear Hustle is produced on the inside by me, Nigel Poor, Rasan New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, and Pat Masidi Miller. And on the outside by me, Erlon Woods and Bruce Wallace. This episode was scored with music by Antoine Williams, David Jassy, and Rashid Zinnemann. The remix of our theme song played on this episode came from Ear Hustle listener Inky from Iceland. Aaron Wade is our digital producer. Curtis Fox is our senior producer. Julie Shapiro is our executive producer for Radiotopia. We want to thank Warden Ron Davis, and we also want to thank Lieutenant Sam Robinson for being in this episode. So what do you think, E? Is he going to approve this one? Nah, he might not even approve his own self. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's find out. (laughs) This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison. And Erlon may be right. You know, I had to weigh in and really consider whether I want to approve myself. But uh, after some long, thoughtful, 
let me read with you. This was nice. Of course, I do approve this episode. Next time on Ear Hustle, the repercussions of a single moment. I took the gun out of my pocket, turned around, put it to his neck, and pulled the trigger. There was a bright flash of light, and then I could feel nothing. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Check out our website, earhustlesq.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter, see pictures of people in our stories, and it's also a place to buy Ear Hustle sticker packs, mugs, and t-shirts. So please check it out. And you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Ear Hustle SQ. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Erlon Woods. I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. Yeah, they asked me what you look like when you were younger. I just told them a little thinner. <laughs> <laughs> I little, think that goes both ways. A little, a little afro. Um, Initially, hold on. Yeah. So, yeah, I did evolve to an afro. Yeah. You're right, you're yes. right. Radiotopia. Radiotopia.